I'm a professor in biology. My name is Mike Mahan. And um, the focus of our lab is understanding the molecular basis of infectious disease uh, with the goal of designing intervention strategies. Basically, what we want to do is make human and animal medicines. Uh, but today's talk, we're going to talk about antibiotic resistance. And um, like multi-drug multi resistant superbugs are some of the most serious threats we have to public health worldwide. There are drug-resistant drug staph strains, drug-resistant strep strains, drug-resistant TB strains. If you get one of these infections, there are, there are no antibiotics that can save you. It's a death sentence. And so um, today we're going to talk about how we got there. So basically, where have all the antibiotics gone? Um, it used to be great. Uh, and here's a little history of the antibiotics in 1929. Everyone who's taken bio has heard about Alexander Fleming discovering penicillin on, on her petri plates. And uh, in the 1940s uh, was the first therapeutic use of antibiotics, basically World War II. In the 1950 to 1960, that was the golden age of antibiotics. Um, half the antibiotics used today were discovered in that 10-year period. And now, in the present time, we have multi-drug resistant superbugs. These weren't around uh, back then, and they are now. And, and the problem's getting worse and worse and worse. And basically, um, we have a, down at the bottom of the slide, we have a quote from a, a Hungarian businessman, a Hungarian American businessman, and success breeds complacency, and complacency breeds failure. And we've become very complacent. We relied on antibiotics for a number of years, and uh, and we're still doing the same things. There's been no really, uh, in my opinion, uh, fantastic jumps in, in the way that we look for antibiotics, the way we test antibiotics. For a long time, we're just using you know, the same drugs over and over again. And uh, this, this has had to stop. We're, we're in a battle that we aren't winning right now. Okay, here's a, uh, uh, just to give you an idea of the burden, the antibiotic resistance burden. It's huge. Um, over 2 million uh, antibiotic-resistant infections a year. Um, a minimum estimate, a minimum estimate is 23,000 deaths. And the reality that the, the death toll is likely 10 times that high, over 200,000 deaths in the United States per year. And it's not getting better. The, the latest predictions of the estimated cost of antibiotic resistance in lives and in money um, is 100 million deaths and 100 trillion, at $100 trillion annually by 2050. So basically, this is going to be a huge cost to the world. And talking about a great time to be to starting, starting your career uh, in, in college or um, grad school or postdoc is, is to get into microbiology. Um, this problem's not going away. This is job security. Um, it always will be. Um, and as you know, uh, outbreaks around the world can be anywhere within 24 hours where there's a plane, where there's an airport. And so basically, uh, we're one world, you know, with regard to microbiology. There's not a U.S. pathogen. There's not a, you know, South American pathogen. We're all, we're all linked. And uh, these things can travel fast. Okay. Well, here's uh, an outline of the talk. I'm going to tell you about a new mechanism of antibiotic resistance that we have discovered in my laboratory. Um, this antibiotic resistance is only seen in vivo or during infection. Um, it has escaped, escaped prior detection because the way we test antibiotics are on petri plates. We don't test them in, in, anim, uh, uh, during, in the patient. We test them on petri plates, and then we now, and if they're if they susceptible on petri plates, we now prescribe those, those antibiotics, and sometimes they don't work, okay? And, uh, and this leads to treatment failure and often death of the patient. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with sepsis. It's, it's a syndrome that you get when you have a, a microbial infection, and it leads to multiple organ failure, um, basically um, organ shutdown and death, okay? And death can be uh, around 30% of patients that have sepsis. I mean, it's huge, and uh, claiming 200,000 lives in the United States per year. So, so we got to do something about this problem, okay? It's not going to go away. It's getting worse. And um, so we asked a simple question. We thought, do bacteria become resistant to antibiotics during infection? Are we being fooled by the test that's used? Okay, and so basically, um, the, the idea was, you know, crazily simple. Um, are ba bacteria, are they susceptible to antibiotics in vitro on a Petri plate? 
but are they now resistant to, uh, when, they are, when they're in vivo, when they're actually in the animal? And so <clears throat> this is the, what's the, the world test for antibiotic susceptibility. It's called an AST test, an antimicrobial susceptibility test. The entire world does the same exact test. This was standardized by the World Health Organization in 1961. There has been no changes in 56 years. Okay, and um, anyway, it was, it was reasonable why they, they made a, a standardized test, basically, so you can compare if you were sick in, you know, the U.S. or sick in Africa or sick in South America or Santa Barbara or whatever. That you could all compare, you could pair data and, and get the and get the most information to get the right antibiotics. So it made sense, but after 50 years, you think there would be, you know, we're, we think this needs to be overhauled. Okay, so let's go through the test on what's been done. So bacteria grown in a medium called mueller hinton broth. There's only a few things I want you to remember. That's one of them, mueller hinton broth. We call it MHB. That is the world media that everyone uses, okay? And the reason they do that is that many pathogens grow on it. It's super cheap, and it's widely available. Three great reasons for the world to use this test. Okay, and so what they do, they now expose the bacterium to several different antibiotics, and they see which ones kill on a Petri plate. And then now this information is now provided to the physician, and the physician provides uh, that antibiotic. In this case, on the, on the left panel, antibiotic C now uh, killed, killed the bacteria, turned dark, and, uh, and that's what's prescribed. But sometimes that antibiotic doesn't work, okay? And, uh, and, the, pro and, and, the, and the problem is, is that the anti this, anti this bacterium may change its behavior in the, and its surface and many other things when it's during infection and become resistant to this drug. And so, and that happens. We're going to show you that it does happen, and it happens a lot more than I'm comfortable with. And um, the proposed solution is to change this test to incorporate media that mimic the, uh, the, the, the human tissue, and then maybe you'll get a more accurate reflection of what will happen to the patient when you prescribe that drug. This is not rocket science. This is just this is common sense, in my opinion. Okay, um, so I'm going to give you a little biology lesson about salmonella. Uh, salmonella causes food poisoning, typhoid fever, uh, um, uh, and it, it's uh, it can be a very very nasty pathogen. And so um, this is a, a life cycle of the typhoid fever. Basically, at the end of the and we're going to tell you at the end of the infection, you be, basically become salmonella. Your body becomes salmonella. Um, you orally ingest it, so the, the, that's in your food or your water. The salmonella um, is resistant to uh, killing of the of the, the pH, the low pH of the, of the acid in the intest in the uh, stomach. It then crosses the, uh, the, the 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 intestinal barrier, which is very very unique to be able to do that, to enter into the body, and it gets into your lymphatic system, and that is now dumped into your heart, uh, to your heart basically, into the blood, and that now, now the bacteria can travel, the salmonella can travel throughout the body and get into the liver and spleen, and basically the numbers are 10 to the fifth uh, per gram, 10 to the fifth bacteria, 10 to the fifth bacteria, 10 to the uh, eighth bacteria per gram. We're talking about you, your liver and spleen become salmonella, essentially. And the, to, to, fi to finish the life cycle, the bacteria now, now go from the, uh, the liver to the gallbladder, which is then dumped into the small intestine, causing massive inflammation, perforations of the intestine. The, the end point of this infection cycle is multiple organ failure uh, um, and, and death. Okay, sad. Okay, but I gotta give you just a little biology. Okay, salmonella is a very special, special pathogen. Um, it can get inside immune cells and survive. And you think about this it, kind of weird. Usually bacteria evade immune cells, but salmonella can now defend itself. And what it does, it, it now, uh, as you see on the slide, salmonella can get, in, get into what are called macrophages. These, these are their primary bacterial killers of your immune system. It has learned to seek them out and, and live in them Treat them as a tack, a Uber, or a Lyft around the body. You don't have to call, and uh, it's free. And uh, and what happens? They just blow. If they get to the, they they reside in these vacuoles, these bags, and grow to huge numbers. And they just blow up, blow up the macrophage, and now infect another one. Okay, but we know, and these, these vacuoles are called salmonella-containing vacuoles. So they're they're uh, they're basically a balloon that's inside the cell that gets bigger and bigger and blows up the cell and infects another cell. But we've, uh, 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 for a number of years, people have studied the environment of that bag, that vacuole, 
and uh, we call that SCV, the seminal containing vacuole conditions. We know what those are. And so we simply asked a question. We know salmonella gets there during an infection. What happens to antibiotic resistance when they're exposed to that environment? No one had ever done that before. Okay? So, so basically, um, uh, what I'm showing in this slide is, is a standard test that's used around the world. Um, uh, it's, uh, and, I, and then in the bottom line is the title of the slide, the SCV conditions, the conditions of a macrophage vacuole. Uh, uh, leads to high levels of, of, of a very potent antibiotic called polymyxin. And what you can see on the top panel, we have bacteria grown in MHB, the standard broth. We have that, uh, 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 and, and now what you do is you now grow them up in that broth, and now you simply fill a little Petri plate or dishes full of uh, antibiotic and, and bacteria, and you see if they, if they grow or not. And what's key is the MIC, the minimum inhibitory concentration. What concentration of drug is needed to kill that bacterium. And what you can see here, uh, that when you wrote an MHB, the minimum inhibitory concentration is 0.5 micrograms per mil. So not, not, not that much, it's a very potent antibiotic. But if you grow that same bacteria in conditions that mimic the macrophage vacuole, the salmonella containing conditions, the vacuole conditions, you see what happens, it becomes resistant to 128 micrograms per mil. So you know, that's a couple hundred fold, okay, difference in, in sensitivity. So then we tested other antibiotics. And so polymyxin B, again, we'll start with the top one, the antibiotic. It's on MHB, it, the, the world test says it's very sensitive. Use this antibiotic if you, get, if you have salmonella. Um, the SCV conditions, the macrophage vacuole environment says no, don't use it, it's resistant. And then we now infect animals and now treat them with a the drug, they're resistant, the mice die, okay? And these are drugs that are highly recommended by the by the world test. The same thing with colston, which is considered the last resort drug. It's very potent, but it's also very toxic. So if you're sick and there's nothing else, they give you that. And for salmonella, uh, it doesn't work, okay? In fact, we kind of pushed it, and you can see that mice were resistant to these polymyxins, these colston drugs, at 20 times the dose a physician would recommend for you. You would die of the toxicity of the antibiotic well before it would even begin to slow the growth rate of that bacterium. You're just feeding them with this drug, okay? And it's used. Okay, so, so let's take a little break and see where we are. Um, on the left is, is, is what happens most of the time. You, uh, you get sick, you go to the physician, they take your blood, urine, or feces, they plate it on these plates that we just went through, and they give you the right the antibiotics that's recommended, and for seven to 10 days, you, you feel good. But sometimes you don't feel good. You go back to the, to the physician, and, and, uh, and like what they typically do, they take your blood, urine, and feces again, and they do the same test. Well, you get the same result. Well, they give you the same drug. You don't get better. Okay, and this is very serious because you're going into this, you're getting more sick, you're going into what's called the sepsis syndrome, and, uh, and you're having uh, a lot of damage happening to you before you, they, they're prescribing the right drug. So basically, in addition to not the bacteria, not the, the, the antibiotic not helping you get rid of the bacterium, you actually are bathing the bacteria in the antibiotic, so now it becomes permanently drug resistant. So in our most well-funded uh, hospitals, we are selecting for antibiotic-resistant mutants. That, uh, and we wonder why now, you know, now it's becoming very clear why there's drug-resistant staph and drug-resistant strep. We believe that a lot of this has been contributed to this mechanism. So the, uh, another investigator, um, Victor Nizé, asked the opposite question. Are there drugs? Do bacteria become sensitive in vivo? I.e., is our test excluding drugs that would work? Okay? And so basically, are you on, like resistant, in, on a petri plate, and off, i.e. sensitive, susceptible during infection. Okay, and so, um, again, we're, we're now gonna test, or what he tested was if, are there drugs that are excluded or rejected by this test that would work against really nasty pathogens? And in this case, um, azithromycin, the z pack that I'm sure that many of you've had, it's a great drug. It's the most commonly prescribed drug in the United States. Super cheap, very, uh, and very low toxicity. But on, the, on this AST test, against these nasty, some, these nasty multi drug resistant pathogens, the, the answer is don't use, that, don't use the zithromycin, it's not going to work. Well, sadly, 
Uh, the reason I have the soldiers on the bottom of the slide is that many, some of our soldiers that go to Iraq and Afghanistan, they get these nasty multi-drug resistant superbugs. Uh, they don't get shot, they don't get blown up, they get infected, and uh, they, they're resistant to almost every antibiotic, and they die, okay? And it's just really, really sad. Well, um, Victor Nizé at the, at the University of California at San Diego, he did a similar experiment. He, he, he said, and, and the top, the top um, this is just microbiology jargon, but the Acinetobacter bomani is this multi-drug multi resistant superbug that's in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's not endemic to the United States. Our soldiers get it, and we can't treat it. And you can see on the world test, the MHB test, azithromycin, it says it's resistant. Don't use it. It's the bottom of the list. You're wasting your time. However, he had the courage to, to grow it in cell culture, which is a, which is a medium that um, supports mammalian cell growth, and it was sensitive. He did this also with two other nasty pathogens, Klebsiella pneumonia and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. These are, these are pathogens you don't want to get. It's very limited options for the physician to treat you. And in all cases, they became sensitive to zithromycin in cell culture, and they were sensitive in the mouse. They cleared the infection. And so possibly, this is all done in mice, now there's a race to now do these experiments um, in humans to see if the same thing works. But sadly, uh, many of these soldiers may, probably didn't have to die. They could have gone to CVS anywhere in the world and got azithromycin. I mean, it's, it's, things need to be changed. Okay, so then, the, so is the altered susceptibility, is that shared across the microbial realm? Is this the way microbes roll, basically? So we tested Staphylococcus. You heard of MRSA, the superbug MRSA. We've tested Pseudomonas, which we just talked about. It's a lung infection. Also, people with cystic fibrosis get Pseudomonas infections. Streptococcus. Um, strep pneumonia, um, salmonella, which we just talked about. Um, we, taste, we tested a number of pathogens. And so what we did, it was a simple test. We um, had three host-mimicking media that we now grew these bacteria, many, many different pathogens in, and now we tested them against many antibiotics. And basically, this is just a little... Uh, um, we're just basically the bottom lines. We're testing host mimicking media versus the standard media, okay, and how do the antibiotics work, okay? And we're looking at three types of host mimicking media. One's called DMEM, which is just tissue culture medium, and we'll have a little picture of tissue culture, which is the red liquid. The MLM is, is a nasopharynx. It basically, uh, it's a medium that now uh, uh, mimics the, the, the nasopharynx of the body. And uh, LPM55, which is the macrophage, that special vacuole that the salmonella, um, for instance, that I showed you before, their life inside a macrophage, basically. And we're asking, if we grow those bacteria in these media, will we see a, uh, the, the same thing, that there'll be differences in resistance or susceptibility? Because this could, would be great, because if the answer is yes, that we, we, we right now will have a lot of antibiotics to be able to treat these nasty pathogens that we can get at your local pharmacy, okay? And so, uh, and again, the standard AST medium is Mueller Hinton broth. Okay, um, this is a, a busy slide, but I just want to just to give you a, I want you just to look at reds and blues. Reds means they, these bacteria became more resistant. Blues mean they became more susceptible. And so on the left-hand column, we have 10 isolates of, of, uh, of Staphylococcus, uh, several MRSA strains. Actually, we got these strains, 9 out of 10 strains we got from our local hospital, Cottage Hospital. I went over there, I said, I want your nastiest strains you can find. And we want to see if we can, we can uh, find drugs that can kill them. Okay? These patients are very sick. In fact, the, the, one, the, the second one, MRSA blood, this patient died. Okay? And so what, what we learned was that when we grew these... This, these MRSA strains, these superbugs, in tissue culture medium, we found several, look for the blues, they became susceptible to common antibiotics that, that are not used because the test says don't use them. Okay, and um, we also tested streptococcus pneumonia from human patients, actually children that had uh, strep pneumonia. And again, we got six strains from, from uh, sick children and again, we see that the, that the host mimicking media versus the uh, standard media, there's very, very big, there's large differences between a battery of antibiotics tested on these six strains. And the last busy slide is we're called our gram-negative bacteria. Actually, people talk about MRSA and Staphylococcus. 
What, what physicians are really worried about are, are, are uh, what are called gram-negative bacteria. They have this outer shell that um, surrounds the bacterium. That's why they're called gram-negative. They don't retain stains. That's why they're called gram-negative. And they don't allow antibiotics in. So like acinetobacter baumani, the soldier one in Iraq, that's a, that's a multi-drug resistant gram-negative pathogen. And when you look at that down the, the bottom panel there, when we grow it in um, these multi-drug resistant pathogens in media that they see in the macrophage, uh, drugs that are used, they become highly resistant. They don't do anything. And there's also the reciprocal, the, uh, these bacteria become susceptible. So this, basically, this discovery, this is how microbes roll. This is what, the, this is, it's just, they sense their environment, and then they respond to the environment. The petri plate's not the environment of a body. Okay, so we did... Um, over 1,300 different combinations. I think it was 40 pathogens, 26 antibiotics, uh, and uh, whatever, uh, several media, th uh, three media, and it was like over 1,300 combinations. And so, potentially, uh, uh, the, the world test has been great. It works, it, it, uh, we got the similar results 64% of the time, the green curve. Uncertain is 28%. That means that there was a big difference between the host mimicking media and the standard media, and the invalid is, you know, we're, we're, uh, there's huge differences between what the test said and what, and what the results for the host mimicking media, i.e., the test said it was resistant, well, the standard test said it was resistant, we find it super sensitive, and when the test said, hey, no, use this drug, it's susceptible, it's super resistant, so, um, so it looks like this test, it's been great. It's been worked for 56 years. It's saved a lot of lives, but I think we can do a little bit better than 64%. Okay, now these are just comparing. Let's do the real test. Let's see if we can save some, uh, some clear some infections. And so I'm just gonna, um, we're gonna validate this in animals. Again, we have validated uh, uh, with the, the salmonella. We have validated the salmonella already. We and our, our, our colleagues at UCSD evaluate validated in animals the acinetobacter, the, the arachibacter it's called, the nickname for it. So now we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna test MRSA. So these strains were isolated from patients, from local patients here, okay? And here I'm just going to give you one, one result here. MRSA is the superbug. It's the multi-drug resistant staph aureus that you hear and see in the media, but physicians are very afraid of. It's really hard to treat if you get that, that organism. And what we see here is that on the very left, that we co-trimoxazole, doesn't matter what the drug does, but basically it passed the standard test. This is one of the top scorers with the standard world test. And when we now infect animals with this strain, 90% of them die. That's not good, okay? Um, uh, and here on the, on the, on the right-hand side of the panel, we have the two, two penicillin-like drugs, very cheap, very no toxicity, low, very low toxicity, and they failed the standard test, and all mice lived. Okay, um, now we don't know if the same if the same response will be in human, but we think the same uh, with these specific drugs. But we think there will be drugs that will work exactly like this, and, and we need to do start doing these these tests. And so basically, if a physician had this information, would that would that change his or her decision? We think the answer to that is yes. Okay, so can the AST test be fixed? Um, and we took a shot at it. Um, actually, had an epiphany uh, uh, some months ago. We made this. We published this discovery in June uh, this summer, and around November of the previous year, I was all excited. Hey, we're you know we're we're finding these new antibiotics and and all this stuff, and this guy that had came, who's a seminar speaker, he goes, Mike, that's great because that the pharmaceutical industry is not going to change their test you got to fix their test. And I thought, wow, okay. It was kind of shockwave went past me. And uh, however, we already did the experiment. We published this initial results with Salmonella in 2015, and nothing has changed in the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, that's two years. And, uh, and so we said, you know what? We've been working on it. And what we did, we said, How, what can we sprinkle on those Petri plates such that they would, look, they would work like they were in the animal? And we tried, our, one of the first things we tried was sodium bicarbonate. Sodium bicarbonate is baking soda. It's stuff you stick in your refrigerator make it smell good, basically. And it, what it is, it, it, um, it's, also, it's in your blood at high concentrations. It buffers your, uh, it buffers your blood exactly at pH uh, 7.4. If your blood is pH 7.2, you're on the ground. I mean, that's how tight it is. And uh, it's also in tissue culture medium. 
the physiological levels. And so he said, well, it's a, the bacteria are seeing it in the blood. It's in the tissue culture medium where we've seen all these responses. Um, maybe if we just sprinkle on sodium bicarbonate, the, the standard test will now look like um, a mouse. Okay? Basically, this is a better predict predictor of treatment outcome. Okay, and here's the, the results. The answer is yes. Um, with the, 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 AS, the AS standard world test can be fixed by simply sprinkling the cheapest stuff we have in our lab. It's sodium bicarbonate, baking soda, nothing special about it. And, uh, and it turns out that an MHB, uh, uh, this MRSA, this MRSA, this superbug, was uh, highly resistant to all three antibiotics here on the left under MHB. You add sodium bicarbonate to the MHB, simply sprinkling it on the plate, and the answer, the, the bugs became sensitive. Okay, and then we also have shown that, uh, that, that, that the sensitivity on the plates matched the sensitivity in the animal, i.e. the zithromycin and cephalothin, they, were, became, they went from resistant to sensitive, and cotrimoximol went from sensitive to resistant. So basically, just adding baking soda improved the predictive value of the standard AST test. And guys, we can do a lot better than that. This is just our first shot. I mean, um, and now we're working on other, other matrices, of the, uh, other uh, tissues and fluids of the body and see what, it, what really reflects um, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the patient and be able to, when you go in and you're sick, we're going to give you the best shot of getting the right drug. Okay, the last thing you have, should have to worry about, in my opinion, when you're in, at the hospital is wondering if the physician has prescribed the right drug. <laughs> I mean, you know, really? Um, okay. Um, and so I'd like to close with... Uh, a quote from Victor Nizay, the person that did the Arachibacter experiment. When we published uh, this in June, we published you know, 40 different pathogens and 26 antibiotics, I think. And, and, uh, and he, he, they wrote a commentary, actually it just came out, actually it's formally not in, it's in press for July. And I like to read it because it, to me it really made a lot of sense. This is an MD who sees children all the time. There's been so many soldiers that have passed through Iraq and Afghanistan that they've come back and brought this, this acinium bacter back here to our med centers. Okay, not only do they, were they sick and a lot of them died, they've now, now we have it in the United States and they're our best hospitals. And these kids get it and there's nothing to give them. Okay, and so basically what he said, when this, 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 with his response to our paper that came out in June, when antibiotics don't heal patients, to say that we're just going to stop at this one test and that's it, that's the only test we do for you, just seems ridiculous and we concur, okay? Um, it is ridiculous. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little summary um, of antibiotic resistance. Uh, we've discovered uh, a mechanism of resistance that occurs only in vivo. Um, it, has, it, it leads to treatment failure, and, and we can fix the test. So some potential implications for antibiotic resistance. If the drug, if to the physician, if the drug doesn't work, switch the drug. Don't, don't prescribe the same drug again. Just take number two. There's no risk to the, to the, to the physician. There's no uh, litigation involved. Also, rejected drugs may work, okay, like we have with the case with ACM. And also, wonder drugs may already exist. Pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies store every compound they've ever made in, into a vault, and the first thing they test is, antibiotic, is, is to see if it's an antibiotic. Well, the answer was no, but the wrong test was given. We're saying, get the antibiotic, the robots out, and now try this test. We might have the best antibiotics that, that have ever been discovered, okay? And we've been scouring the Amazon, scouring the, the uh, oceans for the next antibiotic. It has not worked. Why not try, you know, these purified compounds? And last, um, I'd just like to thank my colleagues that, that we, did, we did this. A lot of this work was done at UCSB. Doug Hightop, who's here today, he kind of led the study with Selvi Ersoy and uh, uh, Lucian Barnes, Jennifer Tripp, uh, and Connor Davis, and actually my son, Scott Mahan, is working on this as well, and Jessica, Jessica Kubitschek. And uh, anyway, thanks for the uh, invitation. That was a lot of fun. And I'll address any questions that you may have.